Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Boat Winterization Tech Talk. I am the new branch chief for STEM training, uh, PJ O'Neill. And uh, hopefully this is the first of many in a strong series. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that uh, we will have questions and answers following the presentation and a brief wrap up. Uh, we're scheduled for one hour, so we'll try and honor everyone's time and uh, keep it into that time frame. Uh, but of course, if you have burning questions, we are aiming to please here. Uh, we want to make sure your questions do get answered. Now, with that, I'd like to introduce our presenter for tonight. His name's Dane Hahn. He's originally from a small town in New Jersey, and his family owned and operated uh, four boat yards along Barnegat Bay up and down the coast. And from when he was in high school, he worked in various marinas, engine shops, uh, marine stores, and uh, on the crew of hauling and launching boats, repairing docks, and during season, working the gas dock, you know, pumping, uh, pumping gas, selling ice, things like that. But on his days off, he sailed competitively in the local uh, yacht club races and built and raced his own hydroplane speedboat. Now, he took his father's advice and stepped away from the marina business, and he went to college and made a career, successful career, in publishing and real estate. Uh, and he, he and his family have lived all over in New England, Chicago, and the metropolitan uh, New York, New Jersey area. Over the years, he's done many boats, both sail and power. I know we have um, some sailors out there and power boaters, so uh, um, Dane is an expert in both worlds. Uh, Mr. Hahn joined the Coast Guard Auxiliary about 20 years ago and has served three terms as flotilla commander, 10 years on the national staff as the branch chief of publication partners, and is also currently division commander. Now, he's a lead instructor, member trainer, and teaches most weeks. The classes include boating skills, navigation, GPS, and suddenly command. And he's also created standalone classes such as search and rescue, hurricane preparedness, and boat winterization, our topic tonight. So I will turn it over to Dane to talk about this very timely topic that not only deals with taking care of our vessels and craft as the temperatures drop, but also good advice for whenever we are hauling out our boats. There it is. Okay. Looks great. So um, <clears throat> winterizing your boat. Uh, too often, people don't really do much winterization. And uh, that can be a real problem. I don't know what that other screen is, but that's nice. Um, so we're gonna get into kind of who we are and uh, what we do and things like that. So we're Coast Guard Auxiliary, you know that, uh, and we are the volunteer civilian component of the Coast Guard. I won't get into too much detail there, but this was just something that we, we included. Um, this course is designed to um, provide a boat owner with an overview uh, on how to prepare a boat for the winter. So new boat owners who have never done that, uh, and then their, their old boat owners who've never done it either, um, need a, a, some links to what the, a good way to do this is. And the whole idea is uh, winter can be deadly to a boat. Uh, and the course is designed to help you protect your, your investment and hopefully save thousands of dollars. So this is the agenda for this course. Know your winter weather zone. Uh, we're all in different parts of the country, uh, but uh, I spent most of my uh, boating life uh, either in the Chicago area or New England. And um, in both cases, the weather was um, difficult and crucial. Uh, so you need to know what to expect. Uh, and um, now I'm in Southern Florida where it doesn't get real cold, although we think it's chilly today. Um, so you need to know what to expect from the weather. And you also need to be covered. And by covered, I mean insured for uh, your boat, whatever your policy says, you need to know what it says. You need to know where to keep your boat through the winter. Uh, if you're in uh, the colder parts of the country, uh, you have lots of options. We actually have lots of options everywhere, but use of common sense is pretty, pretty important. Um, I, I make the joke that there's not much common sense going around these days, uh, but you'll have better luck if you talk to 
people who have been doing this. Local knowledge. Um, I can't stress that enough. <laughs> uh, people will say um, the area over there where uh, near that house, that floods in the winter and you don't want to keep your boat over there, that sort of thing. But you won't know that unless you ask. Look at a topographical map and determine what the uh, height, the heights of the, the land uh, is. Look for the low spots. See puddles, muddy areas. These are these are things to avoid. And so, where do you keep your boat? Well, here are the winter state temperature averages. So, if you're in oh the area that I spent most of my time in. Um, that would be zero to 10 degrees or perhaps 15, depending. Uh, but all through uh, the Chicago area, through Wisconsin uh, and going on west through Montana and so forth, the, the country gets pretty cold in some areas. And these being uh, temperature averages, you can get a sense of, of what I'm talking about. So what does your insurance policy say about ice? Because ice comes with cold weather. Um, insurers offer supplemental freezing coverage, even in warm area um, policies. So um, I, I have had, in one boat, I had three different engines because uh, the engine was winterized by the marina and it froze and it blew out the side. So uh, I'm telling you that your insurance and, and, a, and a reputable marina goes a long way toward keeping you on the water. So supplemental freeze coverage might be something you'd want to purchase. If you would choose to purchase it, usually you have to buy it before November because nobody wants to sell you something and have to pay right away. So a little bit more about, uh, about insurance and ice. Uh, the temperate states south of the freeze line usually have the freeze feature automatically added to their policy. but it, I can't speak to your policy. You should see if it does include uh, an ice paragraph and understand what ice can do. Ice can be dangerous. Um, this is a you know, nice boat, got out in a, in a rainstorm kind of thing on a cold, cold uh, snap. So there's a lot of weight involved in that ice. And this is a good way to sink a boat is to is to leave it alone, let it fill up with water and freeze. Very dangerous. So water expands as it freezes. And because of that, if a boat is left in the water, and lots of people do leave their boats in the water, um, if the ice uh, surrounds the hull and, uh, and freezes right up to the hull of the boat, it can crush the boat. Because as, it, as the ice freezes, it expands. And, and so it's pushing off somewhere else, it's pushing off the dock or it's pushing off whatever it's pushing off and it's squeezing your boat. Ice and snow are heavy. Um, and uh, I'd say, as I just mentioned, the weight of the ice can cause a boat to sink. And then when you mix ice and snow or even just water and leaves um, until they plug up the scuppers, when the uh, temperature drops, you can freeze up the whole, the whole um, after deck or the whole cockpit um, and uh, the trap that will trap the water and burst the pipes on board. So you need to decide where will you keep the boat. I'm assuming that uh, you maybe still have an open mind on this. So look at your options. You can keep a boat in the water if you if you want to. Most marinas will allow that. Not all will, but most will. Um, you can keep it outdoors on a trailer. You can keep it at a marina up on the hard, up on the land, um, and you know, propped up and, and carefully left there. Um, you can leave it, depending on the size of the boat, in a storage facility or a garage, uh, or even in a heated facility. I will tell you from experience, you can't beat a heated facility. But think about the winter weather and where your boat will be. If it's in the water, and that, this is best in warm states. But if you have a bubbler under the boat to keep bubbles coming up around it and up the, along the water line, that will keep ice from accumulating and it can work well. Um, 
so long as there's no power failure. Outdoors, the cover you select is key if you're keeping the boat outdoors but on land. Uh, snow can be very heavy. Um, so no matter what you're doing with it, it can either break the uh, supports that you're using uh, to um, keep a shape on your, on, on your boat, or it can sink the boat if it's still in the water. If you keep it in your yard or carport, um, or even a boathouse, there will be no protection from the cold or snow and ice without a cover. The best uh, choice at that time will be uh, shrink wrap. Uh, uh, this is um, vinyl, it's put on with a heat gun and the, and the material shrinks to the shape of the boat and stays with it. Uh, other types that would be like tarpaulins and so forth can, uh, can blow off or, or they can leak, let ice in. If you can keep a boat indoors, your heated garage, for example, that's a great place to store a boat. But remember, if the storm knocks out the electric, your indoor storage will be just as cold as the outdoors. It will be protected still from the outdoor weather, but it will cause potential freezing. Um, and as I said, I lost three engines because of freezing. So this may not be what your dock will look like this winter. Um, but you need to even consider if you are be prepared for something like this. Each boat and each boat owner uh, is a little, a little different. This is a boat that has, um, the ice is not coming all the way to the hull. Uh, so I would suspect that that's a bubbler there. Left out in the water, a boat can freeze in unless there's a bubbler to speculate the warmer water from below up and around the hull. And the arrival of Arctic air coming down um, is what we're all concerned about. This is actually a, a slide from several years ago. But situational awareness, that's going to be how you will maintain and, and save your boat. Keep your boat in mind. Um, let's say that you have it carefully located in a field, let's say a farmer's field, for example, where it's perfectly safe. But what do you think about when a storm is forecast? What do you think about when the weatherman says there's a chance of snow? I say you should make a trip to the boat and make sure it's ready. You need to keep track of it. It's a big investment. Don't let it fail out there. If a storm is coming and the boat's outdoors, do a walk around the boat. Go, go make sure that the cover is on sound, the tie downs are secure. Um, if the boat's inside, to check to make sure it's secure and, and everything is ship shape. In outdoor storage, check to be sure you have access to the storage yard. You may, they may be locking up the gate and you can't get in to see. So you need to be sure of what you've got and, and what you have to deal with. Here's a checklist for winterizing your own boat. Start by prepping your engine. Ensure that all the cooling water has been drained and removed, and that can be salt water or fresh water. You still need to remove it and add antifreeze with a corrosion protection. Consult your owner's manual for specific instructions because all engines are different, but this is what you want to do. You want to make sure that you have antifreeze in place so when the, when the temperature drops, you're all set. Some engines may require complete fogging, and using a stabilizing additive in your fuel system is important. Then you should run the engine and make sure that it's all that the, the, the fluids that you've added have actually all run through the engine. Change the fuel filters and any fuel or water separators in the system. Put the battery on a slow charger in a warm location indoors and you know, preferably not on a cement floor. Um, Batteries have a tendency to discharge when they're, when they're left on, on a concrete floor. So put it up on two by fours or bricks or something like that. Drain your boat's freshwater plumbing, the systems, the sinks, tanks, and heads. Rinse them out first and then add antifreeze to your various plumbing systems. You can use RV antifreeze uh, in your drinking water. Um, it's, it's sold for that exact purpose. 
uh, and uh, it's easy to come by. Walmart has it, for example. Be sure the water is removed from all additional systems, rainwater, washdowns, live wells, bilge pumps. There's lots of water on your boat. Um, make sure the hull drain plugs are out and add antifreeze to the bilge water. If it's going to be an outdoor storage uh, in a rack or on the hard, you want it to be properly winterized and shrink wrapped or, or covered properly. So the vessel should have no issues with the storms. Notice these covers are form fitting. Properly cover your boat or place it into winter storage at a marina. It's, a, it's water that poses the most danger during the off season. And you may need access to your boat that during the winter. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's heat sealed in uh, with a, with a uh, shrink wrap, um, you can ask to have a, a hatchway uh, added to that. So keep that in, in mind uh, while you're winterizing. This is what I'm speaking of is a, is a hatch that unzips so you can get onto the boat if you need to. If the boat's outdoors and the area gets snow, the vinyl shrink wrap is really the key to keeping it uh, safe in there. I and mean, keeping the little critters out too. Usually shrink wrap is professionally installed. If you feel you might need access, have them install the zipper so you can get in. Freeze damage, again, the biggest potential problem, but water in and on your boat can also promote wintertime mold and mildew growth, also corrosion. So as you consider all these tasks, remember your main goal is to keep out water and moisture to the greatest extent possible. So here's a canvas cover. Uh, this will work very well. This is designed to fit this particular boat. It's a manufacturer supplied uh, cover. And um, it's, it's a really an ideal kind of a cover if you're in an area that will not freeze. If you're just gonna use a tarp over your boat, um, you should build a strong back uh, to keep the tarp from becoming just like a swimming pool liner uh, because the weight of the water in the tarp will go down and mirror the shape of the inside of your boat. So something like this will keep the water running off the tarp and, and help keep the boat dry. This, as you can see, is a fairly simple strong back system made out of uh, PVC water pipes. Uh, so it, it's a, a good thing to do and a good thing to have. And at the end of the year, you can either hide it in your garage or throw it away and start over next year. You're not talking about big money. So what about security for your boat? during the winter. Well, if you've paid for winter storage at a marina, they may provide you some security. Possibly they have fenced in areas and lights, cameras, locking gates, and all that sort of thing. Uh, so you have a level of confidence that you, you're probably okay. But be sure to keep your insurance current and tell your insurance agent where the boat will be for the winter. Remove your expensive gear and take it home. Um, your electronics will winter much better indoors where it can be kept warm. And that goes for expensive fishing gear as well. If the boat's going to be in a wide open area subject to wind and, and snow and rain, even in a marina, consider removing other things. Your propeller is quite expensive and a thief can remove it easily with a simple pair of pliers. Now I'm speaking of a propeller from an outboard. Um, but they're not hard to take off. So you may discover uh, when it's time to fit out in spring that you need a few things you didn't thought, think you needed. If you're keeping the vessel outdoors on a trailer, be sure the trailer is secured to a fixed place, maybe even with a chain link fence. Consider jacking up the boat and setting the trailer on cement blocks and then removing the wheels of the trailer and use a trailer lock on the hitch. So no one else could back their vehicle up and drop the trailer onto the, the ball of their truck or, or vehicle. Take a series of photos. This is what your insurance company will tell you. Take a picture of everything. Uh, show all sides of the boat, inside and out, and its condition. Uh, and so these are the things that are in there. Um, for fitting out, if you did a good job in the fall, the spring fitting out will be easy. 
But before you remove the cover, take care of the trailer, grease the bearings, check the lights, replace the wheels that you had taken off. I'm not saying buy new ones, but just put the new ones back on, the old ones back on. Plan to wash the boat from front to back, from top side to keel. This can be done at home or at a car wash, at a do-it-yourself car wash. Check for stains. If you find some stains, look for what caused them. Sometimes there'll be a, a, a crazy stain that's hard to identify, and later you'll discover that something else broke and caused that. So look, look for stains as telltales. Now in the spring, it's time to wax the decks and the superstructure. If you keep the boat in the water, paint the hull with antifouling paint. And there's, there, there are some really good new antifouling paints that um, are made using, I want to say made using hydrogen as a, in, the, in the paint. And it's so slippery that um, it doesn't kill little animals and critters. It's just too slippery for them to attach to the boat. So that's kind of cool. If you remove the battery, make sure it's charged and then bring it back to the boat. And now's the time to check all your electrics too. See the lights work. Often uh, when we do vessel exams at the beginning of a season, there are lights that have blown out for no particular reason, running lights, um, masthead lights, things like that. But most importantly, uh, make sure your, your lights work and check your bilge pump and your horn. Go through your inventory of life jackets. You need one for every person you plan to have on board. So you need various sizes and they should be clean and dry, not worn or faded. Check your rope locker. Make sure that uh, the, your lines are, are clean. Um, your anchor and your anchor line, dock lines and spares all are in good shape. Be sure the engine is running properly. A professional should be involved here. I think you, using a good mechanic is, is really a plus. Check your engine freeze plugs for leaks. A freeze plug let go in a sailboat that we were racing. I don't know how long it had been gone, but people who were down below uh, were getting a carbon monoxide um, issue and we discovered it fortunately in time, but uh, it, it was um, pretty scary. Check that your registration is current. The registration needs to be on board the vessel along with your insurance card and keep them dry. So there's another use for a peanut butter jar when you're done with it, just wash it out, use it to keep these things dry. See that your signaling devices are current. Flares have an expired date, be sure that you're, they're not expired. Your other signaling devices, um, if you have an electric horn, make sure it blows. If you have um, a, a little uh, gas powered uh, horn that is so loud, make sure that, that you have gas in, the, in that little uh, container. Your first aid kit should be reviewed for its contents. Often we, we say, yes, I have the first aid kit. And um, when you open the first aid kit, the little scissors, the little blunt nose scissors are rusted shut. You know, the, the band-aids are all water, discolored from water and so forth. So these are things that you wanna make sure you've got working again. And be sure your marine radio is working and that the antenna goes up and down and, and is, is getting out. The Coast Guard offers a free vessel safety check um, and we're thrilled to come out and do those. Uh, we're there to ensure that your boat meets the minimum legal standards and we'll discuss with you other equipment that's not required by law, but that a prudent mariner should and would have aboard and should and would know how to use. When you pass the safety check, We'll give you a decal you can display that shows that you've met the requirements. It's not a get out of jail free card, but uh, if the Coast Guard or other uh, Marine Patrol people are thinking about asking you to pull over so they can look at your boat, if they see this little uh, decal, you may avoid that. That you'll earn back a half an hour for that day, but and so forth. So. Um, that's this program. It ran a little bit shorter than I thought it would, about 30 minutes altogether. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And we've got answers to lots of questions if you have questions. All right, so you do have questions. We can put them in the chat and we can uh, feed them to Dane. So I'll open the chat here. So, um, 
Let's see. Got the chat open. Yep. So just pop your questions in there. We can um, we can feed them in. Thank you very much. Very very good information. Um, all right. Let's see. So you mentioned you mentioned snow. So this is a good question. You mentioned snow, and that's kind of that's kind of obvious. Uh, but what other weather conditions are are you looking out for? What should what should you be looking for? Um, whether it's the news or weather apps or you know anything like that that would should send up a red flag to you that you should do some sort of preparation to your boat, check on your boat. Well, we talk about um, that uh, all the time with with uh, people taking our classes. Uh, yes, they should. They should be uh, keeping track of the weather and, and they should keep track of it on broadcast or online. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, newspapers and so forth are a, a day or two late by the time they publish the weather. So you need, really need it to be delivered to you electronically. Uh, other things to look out for are storms, uh, front frontal passages, um, anything like that. Um, we In Florida, we worry a lot about hurricanes uh, and um, and I guess everybody has a feeling for hurricanes, but um, we get we get we get them early, and uh, they come in. They're they're pretty strong. So that's a that's an area of weather that is important to us. Uh, but just um, and in terms of winterizing a boat, um, you you don't really need to to be too mindful of um, of tides uh, unless you you have your boat. In the water or at a dock, uh, because you you can get some pretty high tides certain times of the winter time, um, and you can also depending on where the boat is, uh, the fetch that occurs across a long a long body of water can bring a lot of waves up on uh, on shore and and onto your boat. So those are other areas to look at. But I think if you if you find a um, a weather weather man, let's say. Uh, at a TV station that you're going to look at regularly, um, and that person does a good job of of uh, giving you that kind of information, then I would I would stay with that. And in in our area, the TV stations all have um, uh, links. They all have uh, uh, links to their websites, uh, and then they will send you. If you ask for specific information, they'll send it to you as a text. So that's a big help. And, you know, I'm all the time getting a little ding on my phone and looking and seeing that, you know, rain's going to start in 10 minutes, that sort of thing. So um, there are plenty of weather apps out there that will give you that kind of information um, that have um, uh, radar weather and, and so forth. I, I'm not going to name any of them particularly because you probably have different ones in your area than I do, but um, that's a good way to know what's coming. Uh, and, um, you know, if, if your boat is up, let's say you have a sailboat uh, and it's up on the ground, it's up on the hard and it's set up um, to be ready for the winter and your mast is still up and you have a storm coming in with 60 or 70 knot gusts, uh, you may want to just go over and make sure that everything's looking okay. And uh, because there's it, at some point it's too late. So, you know, that's a, that's something that you need to keep in mind. Usually when people put their boats up, the, the mast lays on the ground next to the boat, but not always. Sometimes we see them with the masts up. Somebody asks, um, do you have a recommendation for cleaning lines? Um, you know, I, yes and no. Um, I'm sure there are arguments of this both both ways. I know plenty of people who take their nylon lines and just put them in a washing machine. Um, and um, hopefully uh, then they put them in the dryer, I, I assume. And um, the, so the lines always look nice. I don't know if that shortens the life of the line or not. Um, so I don't have any personal recommendations. I think that the, that the uh, line manufacturers, that'd be a good question to ask one of the rope companies, you know, how do we clean the, how do we clean these? I'm sure they would say, don't use any harsh chemistry. Um, and, um, you know, even though harsh chemistry really gets to the, to the bottom of what, why you want to clean them, um, it may also ruin the line. So there's that. 
How what often I, should we end? Go what, ahead. what I've what I've uh, uh, read, Dane, is that you should use a, a gentle detergent, and mm -hmm. it's a good idea to put the line into a mesh bag, um, because that will uh, help prevent the line from wrapping around uh, any structure inside the uh, the uh, washing machine. Uh, when I've washed line, uh, I don't throw it in the dryer. Um, I uh, hang it over a rail and let it dry, air dry. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier on the line. That's what the fire department does with the hoses too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. That's a good answer. Yeah, the, good answer. The, the mesh bag is definitely a good tip. Um, and for any of us that are guilty of, in any circumstance, improperly stowing line, somehow, when you walk away, when you come back to the line, they've found a way to tangle themselves up into an awful mess. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You're right, they do. Um, so, how, we, we, have a, we have a good one here. Um, so you, you did mention, right, in the winterization process, um, changing the filters, but in general, right, how often should the uh, engine oil and filters be changed? You know, that answer is in the, the manual that you get with your engine. I mean, each manufacturer has their, their chosen um, period of time under which you should change it, uh, you know. So I don't wanna try and say, oh yeah, every uh, six months or whatever. But certainly if you're winterizing your engine, um, that's a good time to, to do it, to do it once anyway. And maybe halfway through the next season would be another good time. Um, yeah, and it's and, and again, it depends on the engine, what kind of an engine it is. So that's uh, you know, I'm 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 thinking, is it a is it a diesel? Is it gasoline? Is it an inboard, uh, or is it an outboard? Or how often should you do it? And th everyone's going to be um, a little bit different. They all will err on the side of too frequently, but that's fine. But so. the point you're making uh, that people should take to heart as well is read the owner's manual exactly exactly and and even if you don't have one most owner's manuals can be found online if you i mean i i have a yanmar diesel uh that you know i i i when i bought the boat it came with the yanmar diesel let me put it that way and it didn't come with much else i certainly didn't get a manual uh, but i found online that i could reprint the manual for that particular engine no problem so yeah it's there. There's another question here about uh, keeping a boat's cabin dehumidified <clears throat> during a cold winter. Oh, well, if it's cold enough, you don't have to worry about the humidity. Uh, but I, I, I know where you're going with this question. There, there are people who sell uh, products like a plastic bag that's got some hygroscopic uh, crystals in it, and that, that attracts and absorbs water, and the bag gets full of water over time. Um, and they sell them uh, in a, a lot of different stores, um, sometimes just as a, as a, not just a dehumidifier, but something that keeps smells out of a closet and that sort of thing. So there's that. Um, there are people who put um, a light bulb uh, at the end of a, of a, of a, like a trouble wire, you know, a, like you would use a, under a car or something like that. And just leaving the light on uh, will have a tendency to um, eliminate some of the humidity uh, in, the, in there. Again, that's not an answer that I have one of. I don't know uh, what the best way is to dehumidify a frozen boat. So, Well, there, there are a couple of additional things to consider in trying to, to keep uh, humidity down and uh, keep from um, creating uh, an environment where smells will uh, accumulate. Uh, one is uh, that you wanna open all the drawers and uh, doors in inside the uh, cabin, uh, including the storage compartments and so on. Um, and if you are leaving cushions in the boat and there's no right or wrong answer to that, but you may want to consider taking the cushions home. If you don't take them home, you should consider turning them up on their side 
and put them at odd angles because you want as much air circulation as possible around them. Uh, and something else that isn't necessarily good for dehumidifying, but it keeps the smells down, is to buy uh, a, a bar of Irish Spring, the original uh, type of Irish Spring soap, and put a bar in each of the compartments uh, in your boat. It's amazing how effective this is at keeping uh, smells down in the in your ice box. Uh, in addition to baking soda, you should also consider uh, opening a, a can of uh, coffee grounds because they that'll keep the smells down and it will also attract the moisture. All good ideas. They are. Um... There was something else that I, I, I wanted to mention, and that was when you put the boat up, if it's an inboard, uh, be sure to plug the exhaust pipe. Um, that's where, I don't know how they get in there, but little mice have a tendency to be able to somehow leap from the ground up into that exhaust pipe hole, and they will build a, a whole little city in your, in your um, muffler area or through, throughout your, your cooling area. Uh, so you don't want that either. But yeah, these are good. These are good ideas. Good thoughts. A closely analogous problem is um, the uh, little uh, passageways in your spars on sailboats. Uh, on an awful lot of spars, uh, the mast or the boom, there may be a hole and um, uh, birds like barn swallows will like to build nests in those. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that those are, are plugged up as well so that they don't become uh, great little nesting boxes. Okay, I'm, I'm making changes here on this presentation as, as we speak. So that's all, those are all good thoughts. And um, you're right about, uh, about birds moving in when you least expect it, and especially um, uh, in that, in my uh, sort of bio, it goes on about the, the various marinas that uh, the family owned. Um, we had tons of birds in, in our big sheds. And our big sheds were, you know, 30 feet high and 150 feet long, that kind of thing. And you, you couldn't get them out of there. You know, they, there's no way to scare them out. Even, even uh, some shrieking thing that plugged in and made an awful noise all night um, was supposed to drive them away. But it didn't work. So, uh, if if you haven't done it already, just putting together a checklist that you can go through year after year is really good. Uh, most of us will forget to do something, and uh, as you find a little technique that works for you, uh, putting it on your checklist so that next year when you're winterizing your boat, you'll remember to do it. Um, that's true of so many other things that we do on our boats, like uh, procedures for getting underway and for leaving the boat at the end of the day, so that you make sure that you uh, do all of the things that are needed to ensure that the boat is going to be in good shape the next time you see it. All good. Thanks, Bruce. So yeah, that, that, that certainly is a great idea. Um, you know, not obviously the checklist is going to be a little bit shorter if you were, you know, like me and you have, a, you have a smaller outboard and it's a, it's an open craft and there is no cabin and you're going to be trailer storing your boat for the winter, you know, versus a, you know, cabin cruiser or, or a sailboat. Um, but, you know, many, many of the procedures that we all already, already do to get underway, um, are just enhanced by going through the checklist every time. And I think at the beginning of the presentation, you know, Dane, you made a good point that, you know, you may be new to this, perhaps you've been around boats your whole life and haven't been responsible for one. And, you know, you're coming up on your, on your, your first time hauling out for the season, um, but you also may be a seasoned boater. And uh, in, in many areas of boating, sometimes seasoned boaters can make the biggest mistakes because of their familiar familiarity with, uh, you know, with what they're doing, you know, and it's very easy to overlook some of the steps. And I know that I was taking notes 
um, uh, during your presentation, Dane, uh, because you know there are a few points brought up that you know I hadn't hadn't really thought of, and uh, some of Bruce's tips too. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, common sense didn't prevail one year with uh, even even though it's you know even though it's uh, open to the air with the uh, the cushions and although the the mechanics and the hull and everything else of the boat was properly winterized, the smell was still there. And, uh, you know, we ended up having to get, uh, get, a, get quite a bit of reupholstering done. So oh, yeah, some, some wonderful tips. Uh, are there any other questions um, from anybody else? You can put them in the chat. While people are thinking about that, uh, let me offer a couple other suggestions. Uh, and Dane has alluded to this. Um, take this as an opportunity to look at everything on your boat from stem to stern to make sure that it looks like it's in good shape. Uh, one of the uh, frequently overlooked things is what is the state of the lifelines on your boat? Um, are they still intact uh, or are they starting to look come apart. If you have a sailboat, what's the state of the standing rigging? Uh, the last thing you want to have happen is for your mast to come down uh, at a time not of your choosing. Uh, another thing you for may sure. want to another thing you may want to consider doing is at the end of the season, take your uh, anchor and its road out of its locker and uh, stretch it out, ex uh, uh, rinse it out thoroughly, and inspect it carefully. Uh, one of the things you particularly want to pay attention to is um, uh, the connection points, the shackles uh, that connect the uh, anchor to the chain and the chain to the line. These are points that can fail if you haven't moused those connection points, you really need to, uh, because if you deploy an anchor during the season and uh, it makes it down to the bottom, but you can't haul it back up, uh, all you've done is uh, contributed to the detritus on the bottom of the bay. So uh, take, take that extra time to make sure that all of your gear is in good shape. Look at your life jackets. Do they still look good? They don't last forever, you know. Uh, if you have uh, a life jacket with um, that's inflatable, how long has it been since you have replaced the, uh, the cartridge in it? Those don't last forever. Same with uh, fire extinguishers. Those don't last forever. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, the the uh, inflatable life jackets that we have have an expiration date on the dial, there, at which point you're supposed to um, uh, get a whole new system to install on there. Uh, so, but uh, really? you, do you look at it? You know, does anybody yeah. look at it? Yeah, and you know, a lot of a lot of the tips, of course, are going to protect your boat. Um, but I, I've also noticed many of these are congruent with, you know, passing the, the basic minimum requirements for safety in state law, right? For passing a vessel safety check, right? It's going mm -hmm. to, you know, when, you, when you're setting up for the spring or, you know, summer, depending what you use your boat for, you know, you're just going to be, you know, that much closer. Um, so I thought, you know, all, the, all these tips of, you know, go, goes beyond just protecting uh, the boat through the elements, but really it is, I think, to reiterate that opportunity, as you said, uh, to, to go through the boat stem to stern and really think about what the use of your boat use is going to be also for the upcoming season. I do know people that have, you know, gone from, from fishing to, you know, that this particular boat is not going to be a fishing, you know, they're not going to do much fishing this year. It's going to be a pleasure boat for the family. And you're really going to have to think about that, the dynamic of who's going to be on your boat, when and how it's going to be used, right? Because that's going to change, you know, perhaps the configuration of some of, the, you know, some of what you're going to want to do. And, 
it seems like when you do haul out, that's a great time to really think about it and plan that out. If you're making any of those kind of configuration changes. Right. Fantastic. I don't see any more questions. Um, so I would like to thank you, uh, Dane, for this uh, presentation. Um, I do want to tell everyone that is viewing tonight and our future viewers uh, that this uh, presentation is going to uh, be posted on the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary Ox Scout uh, YouTube channel. And I think we still have the link readily available. Yes, I just put that in the chat. So if you're not familiar with the YouTube channel, uh, not only this particular talk, uh, we will, uh, we have all previous tech talks and all future test talk, tech talks will be posted on the channel. And not only is it good for reviewing purposes privately, if you are new to the information, this was a lot of information presented very quickly, it's worthwhile to go back and take a look at your own speed. Um, but if you are familiar with the information and you're involved in the Auxiliary or Sea Scouts, uh, it can be used as a training material in a group setting. It's ready to go training material, which is something that we are, we're always looking for, right? Um, Ed, uh, Ed Burns uh, says, don't forget to remove the EPIRBs. Wow, what an investment. Yeah, if you, if you, uh, if you forget the EPIRBs out there and uh, all of a sudden, Come, boat, come boating season, you have an issue with those. Um, anything to add with that, Dot, uh, Dane? No, I agree with that. I, I, I was not even thinking when I was working on this about you know, th that kind of um, an item. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of electronics and stuff, but there's a lot of things you need to remove and should remove as, uh, as you face the winter. Well, with and also, and, and also as you as you face the opportunity for you know possibly somebody getting on board and helping themselves to some of your stuff right that's well, the e-perbs are expensive no question it, it's both a, a a potential thing to be stolen but it also could go off accidentally and you'd hate to have the coast guard get called out for an EPIRB that has been set off for whatever reason, and it isn't an emergency. That's true. Sure, didn't think of that. Yeah. That's another one to add to the checklist. Yeah. That's right. Fantastic. I, I had a, a fellow I worked with who uh, one day got a call saying that uh, apparently his his boat was in trouble that the EPIRB had just gone off and he said I sold that boat years ago so they they, they didn't know the you know they had never updated uh, the connection at the other end so he said I apparently it happened in Europe so wow. the boat apparently made its way across the ocean yeah yeah um related to the EPIRBs, it can happen at any level. Um, I was recently on a Coast Guard cutter, so I will just disclose it was not this cutter, but a previous cutter. I was there and witnessed it. Um, the Combat Information Center on the cutter got notification from uh, Sector Miami that there must be a boat in distress. There's a call coming out. And in planning how to respond to the call, they realized that the call was coming from one of the, de the devices on the cutter. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so it was, it was operator error, you know, of uh, some bosun's mate or boarding team member or something, but we had no small boats out. So these things do happen, you know, yes, and it can yeah. happen, you know, it can, it can happen to the most, uh, to the professionals. All good. All right, well, I don't see any more questions. So I do wanna thank everyone that logged in tonight. Uh, we will be posting the upcoming year's uh, topics for Tech Talks as we get those all solidified. And again, this tech talk as well as all previous ones are available um, 
for you and um, for the people in your network. Please, you know, share the information of where, what they are and where they can be found so that they can reach the intended audiences, right? And, and you know, spread the information. Uh, thank you very much, Dane, again, for, for the presentation. And if there are no further questions or comments, I'd wish everyone a good night and I hope to see you at the next Tech Talk.